Today I'm going to talk about a first order bandpass filter and I'm going to use the Lagrangian to solve it. So here you see a picture of a first order bandpass filter and we're going to use an idealized amplifier and what that means is that the input resistance of the amplifier is infinite and you just generate essentially an A times the delta of the voltage that you find here, which is tiny and can be considered zero later on. Okay, and that's what you will find on E0. But it's a linear ideal amplifier. Okay, in order to use Lagrangians, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to calculate or find out what the generalized coordinates are. And they're also called flux, flux linkage coordinates. And if you look at the picture here, you can identify four points that uh, could be used as generalized coordinates. And that's lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, and lambda 4 over here. Okay. Now there are some dependencies. For instance, on lambda 1, lambda 1 is immediately steered by ES. So there is no infinitesimal delta in lambda 1. So that cannot really be used as a generalized coordinate. Also, for the output, something similar happens. It's driven by a voltage from the amplifier, which could be considered a voltage, which is equal to A times E plus minus E minus. So the voltage difference here is amplified by A and provided on the output, because it's an idealized amplifier after all. So lambda 4 cannot be used as a generalized coordinate either. So the only two generalized coordinates that remain are lambda 2 and lambda 3. And that's what we're using. Yeah, going forward, we will use these two as generalized coordinates. Now let's take a look at the generalized currents. There are two non-conservative objects in this schematic, and that's R1 and that's R2. Okay, because energy that will be put into those devices will be converted into heat. So these are non-conservative type of generalized forces, and in this case, generalized currents. So how do we calculate that? It's very simple. You do lambda 3 minus lambda 2 dot, which is the voltage, over the resistance R1. That gives you the current. That's the generalized current. Times delta lambda 3 minus delta lambda 2 on this one. And you do exactly the same on the R2 side with lambda 4 dot minus lambda 3 dot over R2. Voltage difference between those points times the infinitesimal displacements over here. If you work that out, remember that delta lambda 4 equals 0, as we determined before, because it's attached to a source that's pushing. So that can be considered 0. If you take that out and you collect terms with delta lambda 2 and delta lambda 3, you get these generalized currents. So there's a generalized current I2 and there's a generalized current I3 over here. Okay? So our next step is to come up with a Lagrangian and that's usually a combination of potential and kinetic energy. Now the kinetic energy here can be considered as the energy in the capacitors and the potential energy can be considered as the energy in the uh, in the inductors but there are no inductors in the system so that will be zero and the energy of the capacitors there are essentially two capacitors how much energy is in those capacitors well for c1 it's a half c1 times u squared and that's lambda 2 dot minus lambda 1 dot squared and for c2 that's obviously lambda 4 dot minus lambda 3 dot squared times a half c2 okay so that's the energy the kinetic energy of the lagrangian and that's immediately the total Lagrangian because there are no inductors in the system. Okay, so this is our Lagrangian at this point. So now we can come up with a Lagrange uh, with our equations of motion by using the Lagrange equation. For clarity, I put down the Lagrangian again. I put down lambda 1 dot, which was ES, lambda 4 dot, which, which was E0, and lambda 3 dot, which was not zero, but I make this zero because it's essentially grounded. And the way you can see that is as follows. Lambda three is connected to the E minus. It's an ideal amplifier. So there's no current running here. That means that the voltage, this is grounded. So E plus is grounded. So 
lambda 3 will also be grounded and as a consequence lambda 3 dot will be zero okay so that's why I take lambda 3 dot is zero over there because the voltage is zero okay so let's start with the first equation the Lagrange equation for uh, lambda 2 so differentiating this Lagrangian towards lambda 2 which is our first generalized coordinate will give you c1 lambda 2 double dot if you differentiate it after that with respect to t minus c1 lambda 1 double dot okay there's no dependency of uh, the Lagrangian with respect to a lambda 2 only lambda 2 dots so this one is 0 and ik is i2 and I took that to the other side so that becomes a plus 1 over r1 lambda 2 dot minus 1 over r1 lambda 3 dot okay so that's our first equation of motion which can be rewritten into this form which I did over here it's exactly the same uh, of course assuming that lambda 3 dot equals 0 so this one disappears and then it's exactly the same as this okay and lambda 1 dot of course uh, is an uh, <coughs> lambda 1 double dot over here becomes an ES dot over here okay so if you differentiate this once you get an ES dot and that's your lambda 1 double dot which is substituted okay so for the second one you do something similar but now with respect to lambda 3 so first you're gonna differentiate the Lagrangian with respect to lambda 3 dot here and you get these two terms and then you're gonna insert i3 also on the other side there's again no dependency on lambda 3 in the Lagrangian so this term goes that's zero and this one is just filled out on uh, filled out and taken to the other side and you get this equation okay and you can simplify that again using these rules to this and now you have your equation of motion okay so we have two equations of motion right now and what we're going to do is we're going to try to come up with a transfer function and the reason is because we want to see how the frequency response is of this system because we claim it to be a bandpass filter well we better show that it actually is so in order to do that I'm gonna express I'm gonna eliminate lambda 2's and I'm gonna express E0 into ES okay so how do we do that lambda 2 is rewritten from this equation lambda 2 is just written like so by taking these two to the other side and then I differentiate this component one time with respect to time and you get this of course right E single dot becomes E double dot and E zero becomes uh, E zero dot by differentiating and then these two equations will be filled out in here and we see that happening here so you have C1 lambda two double dot which is essentially that one putting in here plus one over R1 this equation put in there and that's equals c1 es dot okay and you can rewrite this and you can rewrite it into this form so this is now our equation of motion and this equation describes the relationship between es the input voltage and the output voltage e0 okay now what we're going to do next is somewhat different from our usual approach usually we start solving this differential equation it's a second order linear differential equation which you can solve with for instance Laplace transforms or something like that but we're not going to do that because we're not interested in uh, transient behavior of the system we are interested in so-called stable uh, response and we are interested specifically in frequency response of the system because that gives you a way to actually see that it is a bandwidth filter or a bandpass filter okay so in order to do that we're going to do a frequency transform on this equation and a frequency transform is quite simple if you have an e dot you just replace it with j omega and if you have an e dot dot like in this case you replace it with g omega squared times e zero and now e zero is not in the time domain anymore but this is in the frequency domain okay and you do the same for this term you get one single j omega plus your e0 and this term is transferred from the time domain to the frequency domain you do the same on the right hand side 
you have minus R2 C1 times E S dot. So there's one J omega popping up there. Okay. Now, if we do this, we can uh, rewrite this a little bit. And we can rewrite this into the following. We can split this long term up into two separate terms. And these two separate terms can be verified to be equal to this one by just working it out. You can see 1 times 1 equals 1 over here. 1 times j omega r to c2, that's that term. j omega r1 c1 times 1 is that term. And then the j omega squared times r1 c1 r2 c2 is that term. So it's exactly the same. And now we can rewrite this form as a real transition, right, between output and input. So this is the output, this is the input. What's the ratio? It's minus j omega r to c1 divided by this term and divided by this term. And for people who know a little bit about filters and frequency domain, etc., you can immediately see that this is a first order filter. This is a first order filter, right? And this is some sort of a differentiator, <coughs> okay? So let's try to see if this in fact is um, a band pass filter. And we're gonna do that by inserting some values and see what happens. Okay, so I assume C1 to be one, C2 to be a half, R1 to be one and R2 to be one. If you fill that out, plug it in, you get this function. And I'm gonna try to write, uh, plot this function in a Bode plot, okay? So I wrote out this function again, and I'm gonna create a Bode plot from this. The cool thing about a Bode plot is that it is a logarithmic plot. On the horizontal axis, you get your frequency omega, and on the vertical axis, you get 20 log, the 10 log of the amplitude, the absolute value of the amplitude. So that's what you get here. And if you look at it, it's a logarithmic plot that means that this, which are products, essentially, it's a product of three things. It's a product of j omega it's a, and, a, uh, and 1 over 1 plus j omega and 1 over 1 plus j omega over 2. So those three components are essentially three separate plots. I can plot in here and later add up. Why can you add them up? Because it's logarithmic. And if you do a log, for instance, as a side note, log ABC, that is nothing more than log A, plus log B, plus log C, okay? So you have the ability to convert this product into a sum by looking at a logarithmic plot. And that's what we're gonna do, and that's a Bode plot. So this first one, let's start with the top. If omega gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it will go up, 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 okay? So the amplitude of this transfer function will become taller and taller and taller, and if you print that out in a plot, you get something like this, and the angle is 6 dB, okay? This is our zero of the transfer function. So this is our first function here, that one. Now you go to the second function, one over one plus j omega. At omega is one, which is this point here, omega is one, right? Omega starts to dominate, before that, Omega is really, really small. So say that omega is zero, then your transfer function is one. And as a consequence, your 20 log that becomes zero. And you, this piece will be part of that first order filter. When omega starts to dominate, it will go down to 6 dB. Just like that one, but now with minus 6 dB. Okay, so this little filter here, this first order filter will have this behavior. And this filter, by the way, is this piece, okay? And that filter is that piece. So now for the second one, you do the same, but now with omega is two, let's say that omega is two is about here, omega is two. And again, you get a filter that goes there. It's zero all the way up to two, because one dominates. And then at omega is equals two, this term starts to dominate, and it will go down with minus 6 dB. Now, in reality, if you draw something like this, it's never something like that, right? But it's more like, it, it goes more like this, right? 
there's a 3 dB point here, so you lose minus 3 dB at this point already, which I didn't draw here. But for simplicity you can say that the diagram kind of looks like this in approximation. And now you can just add them up. If you add up the first one, you get this piece. The other two are zero, right? This one and this one in this piece are both zero. So you will get this. At between omega is one and omega is two, this is plus six and this is minus six. You, so you get this piece here, okay? And then if omega gets bigger than two, you get minus six, minus six, plus six, and it goes down with six. So it follows the exact same line as uh, the second filter here. So you now have really a bandpass filter. If you would draw it in, this is this is the bandpass, right? Over here. So this is your filter now. So frequencies between omega 1 and omega 2 are passed without amplification or uh, attenuation in this case. Of course there's an attenuator and there's an amplification here, so this number might be different, but as a reference. <clears throat> For frequencies above omega is 2, there will be 6 dB attenuation over here, right? And for omegas smaller than 1, there's also 6 dB attenuation, okay? And everything else in this filter here, we have signals that are within these ranges will be passed through. And there is no attenuation or nor amplification in this piece between omegas 1 and omegas 2. And that's exactly the characteristic of a band filter. Okay, so I think this is a great place to stop. If you like this video, please subscribe and please like. And I'll see you in the next.